We are on week three of this series entitled Love is Our Logo. And uh, it really stems from this verse found in John chapter 13, verse 31 to 35. And I'm going to begin reading the last two verses of that. It says, so now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I loved you. You should love each other. In verse 35, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. If Jesus would say it in our modern day vernacular, he would tell us that in the same way you can see the golden arches and identify that that is McDonald's. You don't need to see the name. You just need to see the golden arches. In that same way, you see that logo and you know there's a Big Mac right around the corner in the same way that when you see the love, the quality of love that is possessed and that is manifested in God's people, you will be able to tell, hey, man, they belong to God. Love is our logo. And today we're going to continue in part three, and our message is found in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Now, it's the same writer that writes John chapter 13. This is the disciple whom Jesus loved as self-proclaimed disciple whom Jesus loved. And he now writes this in his later years to the church. And look what he says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. And we're going to read verse 7 to 13, and, and then we're going to go from 19 to 21. And it says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Verse 8, whoever does not love does not know God. Well, what do you mean? Well, he explains it. Whoever does not know love doesn't know God. How could you say that? Oh, because God is love. Because God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Verse 10, this is love. Oh, it's not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now here's where we jump over to verse 19. He says, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And verse 21 is really what I want to unpack for the rest of this talk. It says, and he has given us this command. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. I want to read that to you one more time. It says, and he has given us this one command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and their sister. The title to today's message is God's only command. God's only command. And what I want to do is I want to break down for us today, and I want to unpack this idea. It's an idea that God has been ministering to me for the last several years on this idea that God has given his children, his sons and daughters, simply one command. It's God's only command, and I want to unpack that for us today, that under the dispensation of God's grace, and under, under the entry of Jesus Christ's life on earth, death, burial, and resurrection, what we are left with to abide by is God's one only command. I want you to help me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these next few moments that we have with one another. We thank you, Lord, that we can share together, that we can hear your word, O oh God, that we can be in the same room even though we're not in the same room that we can ab abide in the same space even though we are not physically in the same geographical location. That we can be with one another, that we can be together.
hearing your word. We thank you for these next few moments. We pray that you open up our hearts to hear your word clearly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Now, I've seen so many pictures, and I think in the last few weeks, we've seen a lot of us, we've become chefs. We've been throwing it down in the kitchen. I mean, we've been, we've been throwing it down. We've been, I've seen those pictures. We've been, we've been cooking up a storm. Uh, Sister Fran, uh, we call her Mama Fran. She's been throwing it down in the kitchen. She's been baking. And this is actually not a new thing for my wife because my wife's been throwing it down for decades, all right? And, and I love the way Lisa cooks. I, man, there's something about how she cooks that I abs- That's why I wanted to cook all the time. It's not because I just want to see her cooking. It's just because I love how she cooks. And one of my favorite meals is, is this meal called arroz con gandules. Now, let me say that in English, arroz con gandules, all right? And, and when she makes arroz con gandules, it, it carries a key ingredient. In fact, it carries two key ingredients. And it's, it's adobo and sofrito. Let me translate that in English again. Adobo and sofrito, all right? Now, these key ingredients are essential for her to make arroz con gandules. Now, I remember there was one time I was, man, I was in the mood for arroz con gandules. I wanted some delicious arroz con gandules. And I said, baby, can you make me some arroz con gandules? And she told me, I cannot. I said, stop being a rebellious wife. And she said, no, no, I can't because I don't have the key ingredients. I said, what do you mean? She goes, I don't have adobo and sofrito. And I said, can't we just, can you just replace it with something else? Like, can't you just put something else in the mix? And she goes, no, no, no. I can make you rice and pigeon peas. But if you want arroz con gandules, then I'm going to need some adobo and sofrito. Like, you could call it something else. Call it rice and pigeon peas, but you cannot call it arroz con gandules without this key ingredient of adobo and sofrito. Now, I thought about this in preparing for this message because I think that we can draw a parallel when it comes to God's recipe for our life. Because here's the truth. When it comes to God's plan for our life, when it comes to living the abundant life that God has made available for us, We cannot accomplish and we cannot attain all that God has for us and we cannot follow his recipe unless we have these ingredients, this simple ingredients. You know what it's called? It's called loving people. (laughs) Here's the truth, that the recipe that God has for our life will always include loving people. We can try to circumvent it. We can try to replace the ingredient, but you might as well call it something else because you'll never be able to fulfill God's plan for your life unless you learn how to first love people well. You'll never be able to live the abundant life unless you learn how to love people well. You'll never be able to grow spiritually unless you have the key ingredient to spiritual growth, which is loving people well. Well, you'll never be able to attain and fulfill your purpose unless you have the key ingredient of loving people well. So many times we have, Pastor, Pastor, I just want to grow spiritually. I just want to develop. I just want to, I want to go further. I want to reach my destiny. You'll never be able to reach your destiny until you have the key ingredient to reaching your destiny, and it's loving people well. Well, in fact, I want you to write this down if you're taking notes, and and it's this. You cannot mature spiritually without growing relationally. I'll say that again for, for us. You cannot mature spiritually unless or without growing relationally. You will never be able to become spiritually mature without also developing in relationships. In fact, it is impossible for you to become spiritually mature without first learning how to properly love people. And, and I think that some of God's people, we, we, we might have it uh, twisted, if you will. Like, like we think, oh, well, you, what do you know? Like, I've been going to church for 15 years. I want to give you a news flash. You mean... You may be going to church for 15 years, but 15 years of church attendance does not equate to spiritual maturity. But I speak in tongues. Sorry, newsflash. Speaking in tongues does not equate 
to spiritual maturity. But I know all the books of the Bible in alphabetical order. I know numerology and eschatology. Can I serve you notice real quick? You might, this might be offending someone today, but I just want to let you know that knowing all the books of the Bible and knowing um, copious amounts of scripture does not equate to spiritual maturity. You can't grow spiritually without growing relationally. You cannot mature spiritually without growing relationally. And I think that somehow God's people have bought into the lie that we can reach some level of spiritual superiority without first learning how to love people well. And so we'll say things like, yo, I just, it's just me and God. Like, we've always wanted to separate it. It's the human condition, isn't it? It's like, We always look, we want to know God, but we want to stay away from people. And we want to create this divide between God and his people. Like, I I love God, but I'm, I'm just not good at relationships. And I want to submit to you, it's not that you're not good at relationships. It might just be that you're not good at love. And so what we've done is that we've created this separation. It's just my relationship with God. I want to I want to have I want to develop my spiritual gifting so that I can grow in my relationship with God, but you cannot grow in your relationship with God by developing your spiritual gifting. You grow in your relationship with God by developing your love for others. As a matter of fact, the apostle Paul had the same dilemma. He dilemma he was talking to the church of Corinth because the church in Corinth they had One of the most gifted and talented churches of antiquity. I mean, this church was full of people that could prophesy. This church was full of people that knew words of wisdom and words of knowledge. This church had the most amazing worship team. This church, in fact, had the the greatest singers in their region. This church was equipped with people that were gifted. But this church was also filled with people that were backbiting each other, that were gossiping about one another, that was wishing ill will on others. This is the same church. And this is what Paul writes to them because he wants to make it clear to them. Look what he says. He says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in verse 1, it says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, if I speak in in tongues of men and of angels, if I speak in tongues that only the angels are familiar with, but I have not no, but I have not love, then it's of no use. I am simply a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and I understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, can you imagine that level of prophetic gifting? Like you, you are able to decipher all The knowledge, you are able to decipher all the mysteries. And he says this, you could have that. You could even have faith that can move mountains. And you can have all this discernment. But if you have not love, then look what it says. It says, you are, I am nothing. Paul discovered that if I give all I have and I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. What is Paul saying? Paul is, Paul is saying, he says, listen, God's not looking to raise up a church that is simply filled with gifted people. God wants his church to become a gift to people. He's not simply looking for the kind of church that says, hey, we have the most gifted people in our church. He's looking for a church that he can present as a gift to humanity. The reason that this message is called God's only command is because I believe when we study the scriptures that God's intention from the very beginning has always been this one command, that we we are to love him and love one another. That God's only, God's one and only command is that we are to love him and one another. And I know that when we hear this, our, our traditional red flags and our, and our religious red flags go, go up because even in the dispensation of grace, we have people under the new covenant that would say, well, what about the Ten Commandments? And I think that's a really honorable and good question. And so what I want to do is I want to unpack this for you because under the old covenant, what God did in his effort to give these rules to his people 
he had 613 rules and there's there were rules to love God and and love people those 613 rules are broken down by 365 thou shall not and 248 thou shalt within those 365 and those 248 rules laws were what's considered the ceremonial laws for the priest within that you had the civil laws that would allow uh, to assist in governing the people of Israel governing God's people and then you have God's moral law that we have towards one another now why is this important because when Jesus then steps into the scene some 400 years later after the last prophetic book was written Jesus steps into the scene and in Matthew chapter 5 what he will tell us is this he says I did not come to abolish the law now that's important like he says I didn't come to destroy the law here's what I came to do I came to fulfill the law I came to complete the law Jesus says I didn't come to abolish it I came to complete the law but Jesus also says I give you com a command and so even in our understanding of what Jesus has accomplished in fulfilling the entire law we're at times left confused because we're saying well what is it that we have to do what is it that what is the law that I have to abide by can I just abide by the Ten Commandments can I because there's still this human nature that is trying to to attain some type of spiritual spirituality by abiding by the Ten Commandments and so and so uh, we've been taught that if we abide by the Ten Commandments and, 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 and we will be able to reach some type, of, some type of spiritual superiority or grow spiritually. But Jesus tells us to follow his command. And when you understand that Jesus is the fulfiller of the entire law, you also understand that he has fulfilled the entire Ten Commandments. And what he leaves to his people is simply one command and that is to love God and love one another God's only command is that we would love him and love one another and so Jesus is the great fulfiller and when you understand that Jesus is the great fulfiller here's what you here's what you you realize that you're not asking what do I need to follow you're asking who do I need to follow because when you understand that Jesus is the fulfiller, well, he's the only one that was able to fulfill the law in the first place. And the Bible says that this is love, that Jesus has come into the world and he, he, he has come into the world so that we can live in him. Then you ask the question, well, who do I need to follow? Because if I follow Jesus, then I will also fulfill the law. God's only command, I want you to write this down. God's only command fulfills the entire biblical law. God's only command fulfills the entire biblical law and, and I want to bring you to Matthew chapter 5 we're going to go this is going to be like a matrix class right here Matthew chapter 22 a teacher comes to Jesus and asks him a very important question he says which command in the law is the most important Jesus answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now watch this. This is the first and most important command. Now this is where Jesus now begins to, he begins to intertwine what was known as two separate commandments into one. He says, but you know, there's another commandment. And the second command is, is like the first. You see, the second commandment, I know you're, you know that this is the most important commandment, but equally as important as it is to love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your understanding, and all your strength, and all your soul, equally as, as important is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now watch. He says, all of the law and the writings of the prophet take their meaning from these two commands. Another translation will say, are fulfilled in these two commandments commands but notice that Jesus now begins to introduce the idea that this in fact is not two commands it's actually one command he says he says that's important but equally as important as it is to love God it is also important to love one another because when you understand this notion 
to love God and love others, you will fulfill the entire law. We see it again in Luke chapter 10. A man stood up who knew the law, and he tried to trap Jesus. He said, teacher, what must I do to have life that lasts forever? He goes, hey, what do I need to know? What do I need to do to be saved? Jesus said to him, well, what is written in the law? What does the law say? The man said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart. You must love him with all your soul. You must love him with all your strength. You must love him with all your mind. You must love your neighbor as you love yourself. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus said, what does the law say? The man who understood the law did not say back to him the Ten Commandments. Have you ever noticed that? Like, I'm expecting this teacher of the law to recite to Jesus the Ten Commandments. But the teacher of the law, in fact, does not recite to him the Ten Commandments. What he says is, this is what the law says. It is to love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your understanding, and all your strength. And it is to love your neighbor. Notice that he now does not divide the two. He actually speaks of them as if they are one. This is a teacher of the law. Another teacher of the law who was a Pharisee gave his life to Jesus, had an encounter with Jesus Christ. His name is the Apostle Paul, formerly known as Saul. He writes this book to the church in Galatia, and he says, you obey the whole law when you do this one thing. Love your neighbor as you love... Wait, what? You, you obey the, the whole law? <laughs> when you do this one thing? Yeah, you obey the whole law when you do this one thing. You love your neighbor as you love yourself. He goes on and he writes to the church in Rome. He says, oh, oh, nothing to anyone. You don't, you don't owe anyone anything except for your obligation. Your obligation to what, Pastor Rowe? Is to love one another. For if you love one another... You will, ref you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. For the commandments say you must, not commit you must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. What's happening here? Oh, God's intention from the very beginning is being manifested through the life of Jesus Christ. He's saying God's intention has always been this one command. It's to love God and love one another. And in doing that, you fulfill the entire requirements of the law. And he makes it clear in verse 10. Why? Because love does not wrong, does no wrong to others. So law fulfills the requirements of God's law. Now the 613 laws have now become 10 laws, but has become two laws in the introduction of the life of Jesus. But it's clear that upon the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, something has taken place. That Those two laws have, have now become one law. And it is to love God with all your heart and to love others. This is the second thing I want you to write about God's only command. God's only command has been written in your hearts. God's only command has been written in your hearts. I need you to, I need you to lean in right now because, again, when we hear God's only command has been written in our hearts, we think about Hebrews, and Hebrews makes it clear. This is the new covenant. This is the new way of life. This is the new promise that God has made with his people. He says, I will make with my people on that day. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And what we think as our knee-jerk reaction is, oh, God has written the Ten Commandments in our hearts. God has written the Ten Commandments in our minds. Well, that's interesting because if I were to ask you, well, what does commandment number nine say? You'd probably have to Google it. Hey, what, what does commandment number four say? And you probably have to Google that. 
What are the, tell me the Ten Commandments by memory. Well, if God has written them in your mind, then we ought to be able to quote them by memory. But here's what I want to submit to you, that God has not written the Ten Commandments in our minds. God has not written the Ten Commandments in our hearts. The, the law that God has written in our hearts and minds is not a what, it's a who. God has written through the blood of Jesus Christ the person that has fulfilled and completed the law. What's the command that Jesus, through his blood, has written in our hearts? Or oh, is the commandment of love. The commandment that God's written in our hearts is not what, it's not a what, it's a who. It's a far greater command. It, what God has written in our hearts supersedes the standard and the expectations of the law. This is why when Jesus steps into the scene, hear me, Jesus steps into the scene and he starts speaking differently. He starts raising the standard because the law that's been written in your heart is not the Ten Commandments. The law that has been written in your heart is the law of love, is the command of love. This is why he says, you have heard it say, do not commit murder. But I tell you that if you are angry with your, your brother with, with an, with, without a reasonable cause, you have committed murder in your heart. This is why he says, hey, in the law, you know what it says? It says that you shouldn't commit adultery. But if you have lust in your eyes for someone, you have committed adultery in your heart. There's a far greater law that's written in my heart. Hey, do you know that? In the law, in the Ten Commandments, it does not say, thou shalt not lie. Did you know that? You're like, Pastor Ro, that is blasphemy. I know the Ten Commandments say, thou shalt not lie. No, the, the Ninth Commandment is, thou shalt not bear false witness of your neighbor. If you are a good liar, do you know how much wiggle room you have with that one? Like, what? All right. I just won't, I won't bear false witness, but I'll lie about time. I'll lie about a place. I'll lie about the color of my cabinets. I'll lie here. I'll lie there. I'll lie everywhere. I just won't bear false witness of my neighbor. See, but that's, that's if you're abiding by the law of Moses. But when you are living by the person of Jesus Christ through the spirit of Jesus Christ, the law that's been written in your heart supersedes the law of Moses. It's a greater law that's written in your heart. It's the law of God's love that has been etched in your heart. And when you, when you have that love in your heart, you, you find no reason to lie about your neighbor. Bearing false witness of someone else is is not even a thought because your standard is so much greater. In, in preparation for this message, I, I looked up child abuse and neglect laws. Now, I've been a parent for 14 years. I know what you're thinking. It's impossible. He doesn't look he could have a child for 14 years. It's okay. I appreciate it, and I agree. But for 14 years, I've been parenting. And... I looked up these laws in New York of child abuse and child neglect. And you know what I've discovered? That I had no idea of these laws. I didn't know what law number one was. I didn't know what law number two was. In 14 years, I have not had any concept or idea of what child abuse is. However, I have fulfilled every single one of the laws of child abuse and neglect. I have not violated any of those laws. You know why? Because the law of a loving parent is written in my heart. See, even without having the concept of the laws of child abuse and neglect, I have fulfilled them. I have not violated any of them because the law of a loving parent is in my heart. One of those laws is not exposing your son or daughter or your child to any drug activity. 
you know that that's never even been a thought in my mind? Because the law of God's love and the law of a good parent is written in my heart. I want to submit to you today that what God writes in your heart is not thou shalt not steal. He doesn't write that in your heart. He doesn't write in your heart thou shalt not kill. He doesn't write that in your heart. He doesn't write in your heart thou shalt not bear, bear false witness of your name. He doesn't write that in your heart. What he writes in your heart is a law that far supersedes the law of Moses. He writes in your heart the law and the command of love. Woo! He writes the command of love in your heart. And this is what I want to call the great amalgamation. What, th there is no longer a separation of my relationship with God and my relationship with people. It, there is no longer this chasm between God and, and, and my relationship with people because here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that the law was given, but grace came through the person of Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came through the person of Jesus Christ. The law was given, but grace came. Why? Because, because Jesus had to fulfill the standard between God and man, but he also had to fulfill the standard between man and man. He also had to, see, what Jesus did is, is the great amalgamation. He doesn't just, there isn't, these, there isn't this divide. Have you ever wondered how come the Ten Commandments are written in two separate tablets? Couldn't we find a bigger piece of, of stone to write all ten? No, they're written in two separate pieces of stone. Why? Because many scholars believe that five of the Ten Commandments are about our relationship with God. And in fulfilling these five commandments, we are fulfilling our relationship obligations with God. And then five of these laws are written now regarding our relationship with man and our relationship with one another. And so there's two separate tablets one with our relationship with God, one with our relationship with man. And what Jesus does, come on somebody, this is, I'm a, I'm a preach on myself. What Jesus does is that Jesus, he begins to amalgamate these two laws into one. It's no longer, here's my relationship with God and I'm good and, and I can't, I, I'm just not good at my relationship with man. No, no, no. No, because here's the truth. When you love people, you're loving God. And what Jesus does is that he doesn't give us two set of laws. What Jesus does is that he fulfills the law that corresponds with God, but he also fulfills the law that corresponds with man. And then he takes, oh, oh, that's why he's called the God man. That's why he is God incarnate. Because we are no longer experiencing our divide with God and man because Jesus comes and he dies on two pieces of wood. Oh no, it's not two pieces of wood. It's two pieces of wood turned to one cross. And that cross represents our relationship that is, that is vertical with God, but also our horizontal relationship that is a symbol of our relationship with man and those here on earth. What is God's command? It is to love him and love people. And Jesus brings that all into one and he fulfills it. Jesus is the God man. There is no longer any separation. There is no longer a chasm. There is no longer a divide. There's no longer me and God. I don't know about them. It all has become one command. And he, here's what I want to make it clear. John makes it clear for us. Look what he says. He says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. What is he saying? He's like, you, you can't say you love, you can't say you, you can't say that you, you, you don't love, but yet you know God. You can't say that. Why? Because God is love. And so in knowing God, you have to know love. And so you can't say, I don't love, and still say, I know God. Because in loving, in knowing God, you know love. This is how God showed his love 
among us. He sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. Maybe that's the secret. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now watch, here's the appeal. Dear friends, since God so loved you, hear me, lean, lean in, let me lean into you real quick. If God so loved you, you ought to love one another. This is powerful. Because I wish he would say, you ought to love God back. But he says, here's how you love God back. By loving one another. If God so loved you, you are to love one another. Verse 19, we jump over to verse 19. We love because he first loved, the, loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister who they, who they have not seen cannot love God whom they have seen. Whoever says that they love God, but they don't love their brother. Like, like, no, there is no divide. Jesus Christ came and, and he bridged the divide. There isn't no longer that we can have this relationship with God without growing with our fellow man and our fellow brothers and sisters. No, 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 you can't. We, we can't live the, the life that says that, oh, my relationship with God is good, but my relationship with man is not. No. Because when you love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your understanding, you can't help but to love people. Like, have you ever, like, you ever been there? Like, you ever been in that moment of worship? Like, I have, like, God, thank you for forgiving me. Five minutes later, I can't believe you. How would you dare do that to me? No. The separation is done. Because I can't say that I love God, yet I hate my brother. This is why God will tell us through the life of Jesus. He says, hey, if you have a sacrifice and you bring it to the temple, but you have offenses stacked up from your brother, hey, put that sacrifice on the floor. Put your little offering down and go make amends with your brother because it is greater for you to go make amends to your brother. That tells me you love me more than you bringing me a sacrifice and, and an offering. See, he has made the two commandments. One, 1 John chapter 2, verse 7, it says, Dear, oh, let me, let me go back to verse 21. It says, and he has given us this command. Oh, it's the only command. That anyone who loves God must also love their brother. That anyone who loves God must also love their brother. Dear friends, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 7, it says, I'm not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it is an old one. It's an old one that you've heard from the very beginning. What's the old command? Oh, it's to love one another in the same message you've... It's the same message you've heard before. Wait, I'm... Oh, the, there's an old command to love one another, but then the same writer says, through the life of Jesus... So now I'm giving a new command. Oh, that's because it's an old command and a new command. See, it's old because it's always been God's intention. But it's new because now we can fulfill it through the life of Jesus. He says, I'm going to give you a new command because it's new because now you actually have the power to fulfill it. And then 1 John chapter 3 makes it so abundantly clear. And this is Jesus' command. John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. If it wasn't clear up until this point, let it be clear now. And this is Jesus' command to believe in the name of Jesus Christ and to love one another as he commanded us to. What's God's only command? That if you love God, if you believe in Jesus, that you will let love be your logo. So Pastor Ro, we're in these moments where it seems like we're in uncertain times. 
And we, oh, we got to prepare. The church of God has to prepare. The church of God has to get ready. Uh, recently, I mean, messages have been sent to me about Governor Cuomo saying that the state of our city getting better and improving has nothing to do with God. God did not do this. And I just think like this, like, because what's, what's being explained though is, what, is oh, you, if the governor's saying that, that God's wrath is gonna come upon New York City. And I wanna submit to you, like, do you really think that because of the reckless words of one person, that God's wrath is gonna come upon two million people that are seeking God's face? Does God's love does not extend even for someone does not, that does not recognize his glory? And so for a moment, Governor Cuomo might say, well, this was not God. Well, God doesn't throw a conniption because someone is ignorant of God's glory. I want to submit to you that God's wrath will not come upon New York City. Why? Because God loves New York City and God's love is going to permeate New York City. How? Through his people. And if there was ever a more encouraging verse than this, hear me. Read 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. And it says, the end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sins. Pastor, what are we going to do? It feels like the end is coming. Well, here's what Peter says to do. He says, the end of the world is coming soon, but here's what you do. He says, you pray with one another. And here's what you do. Most importantly, keep showing deep, deep love for each other. What is the recipe? What is the, what, what is the, what, what is the preparation? What is the answer to the end times? Oh, that we continue to love one another. Why? Because love continues to cover a multitude of sin. And so what are we going to do with what's happening in the world today? We're going to keep on loving. What we're going to do with the threats? We're going to keep on loving. What we're going to do with the lies? We're going to keep on loving. What are we going to do with manipulation? We're going to keep on loving. What we're going to do if they come after the church? We're going to keep on loving. Oh, somebody ought to give God a praise right there in in the comment section. Throw some fire emojis. I feel hot up in. What are we gonna do? We're gonna keep on loving. So as we conclude today's message, I, I wanna invite you to this love. First John tells us that this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us, which only enables, enables us to love. And I want to invite you to that relationship with him today. Maybe you're watching here for the first time. Maybe you tuned in. Maybe you got this because someone shared it on their page. I want to invite you to, to a relationship with love, to a relationship with God, to a relationship with Jesus Christ coming to die for our sins so that we can live through him that's you right there where you are in your living room, in your kitchen, in your bedroom. Maybe in your, you're in the bathroom on your cell phone. Right there where you are. At the count of three, I just want you to lift up your hand. And I want you to sing this prayer out. I can't see your hands, but God can see it. Come on. One, two, three. Say this prayer after me. Say, Dear Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I place my trust in you. I believe you died for me and rose again on the third day. And from this day forth, I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen and amen and amen. Let us know that you've said that prayer. Go to kuhau.com slash new and fill out a prayer request. Click the tab that says, I've decided to follow Jesus. I've committed my life to Jesus. We want to hear from you. God bless you.